Well, it is great to be here and you get to meet some of you and uh, see what God's doing just in the, in the past year that even giving you this, this, this place, uh, just that's pretty amazing that it happened um, the way that it happened and the timing that it happened, like the week of where you were would have been all shut down. So it's pretty, really neat. And uh, we're going to be, like you said, uh, missionaries to the Northwest uh, Amazon Basin area of Brazil will be there hopefully by the end of uh, January coming up. We've been on the road for about 15 months uh, raising support, and it's just been super awesome how God has kind of expedited us through. We, we had 90% come in last month, and we had, we've already been able to, to buy a house, a car, and our tickets to go back. So it's just a matter of we have two more months of meetings, and then we're going to stop traveling and uh, go say goodbye to family in Ohio, go say goodbye to family in Florida, and then get on a plane and go over there. And so we're just right now working on our visas and the container, getting all of our stuff situated. We've already got everything in storage, wrapped, palletized, labeled. Uh, it needs to be translated into Portuguese. So really that's the last two things is that, uh, and then uh, just our visas with all the, obviously with the pandemic going on, it's kind of made things a little different. But we're excited for that for God to work it out. We're working with a missionary that's been over there 40 years and in the countries in his 70s. And like I was telling him this morning, he, they've been praying for the past eight years for God to send a couple up there to uh, help them and then you know, ultimately to, to take over the work. And that's what we're looking at doing. And so, um, and they're getting happier about it every day too. He was texting me the day because he's got, he's got, he had uh, back surgery, double knee surgery a couple years ago got it all done at once. And so he's been trying to get back to the, the States to get uh, stuff for his spine, uh, some shots in there. And so he's like, man, I can't wait for you to get here. I was like, I bet. So very close. So that's kind of us in a nutshell. We, have a, we do have a website, uh, Schmitz to Brazil, and it's German. So it's S-C-H-M-I-D-T, the, no, the number two. So Schmitz to Brazil.com. And when you go on there, it has everything that you w- would want to know and probably more. Uh, about us. And then at the bottom, we also have a prayer letter, a monthly letter we send out to keep everybody updated about what we do need prayer for and what we have seen in answers to prayer. So when you were praying every month, what, 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 what's happened? Well, a lot of things have happened. So uh, pray and pray for us. I, 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 I failed to bring cards, so I'm sorry. I'll, yeah. Also, is that video promotional? Absolutely. Yes, it is. Yeah, that'd be great. It's on there under our video, or it's also under downloads. Either way, you can uh, watch that. So as you heard this morning, or uh, this afternoon, he's, uh, he rather read, read from Matthew uh, 6, and that's where we're going to be at uh, this afternoon. And we're going to be zeroing in on a particular verse primarily, but we're going to be looking at verses 25 to verse 34 about seeking first the kingdom of God. Now, before we start di- dissecting everything and looking at what Jesus has said here and Ma- Matthew's recorded, you know, understand that there are there are certain things in life that if you if you don't get to experience these things or or, or understand these things or learn these things that your life is okay. Like I'm sure that most of you have never learned how to master a skateboard. Anybody? Yeah. And you know what? It, it's okay. You know, or if you if you never learn how to uh, throw a certain type of fastball or, or, or a curveball or a sinker. It's like it's not going to stop you from getting married, right? That wasn't a prerequisite for marriage. Is he has to be able to throw a curveball, no? Uh, and if you never learn like to master a, a Rubik's cube without YouTube, right? That's a different game, isn't it? To try to figure that out, it, it's going to be okay, and we, we understand that. But we do know though that there are things in life that if you don't understand or you don't learn, then it can ultimately mess up your life, completely change your life. Like salvation is one of those things. You have to have that. That's a good thing to to have nailed down. Well, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus, I believe, brings to our attention one of those areas, and it's a principle that uh, many have abused. Uh, I'm going to go to a country that has, with the, the Pentecost movement, has a huge abuse of this principle. And even here in America, many of people have misunderstood the implications of this. And so um, if, you, if you look at verse 33 again, it's the idea of seeking first the kingdom of God. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, when I would think of 
the idea of seeking first kingdom of God, I would usually think of it in the context of the church, right? And I think that's definitely an aspect of it. But when you look at all that Jesus has set up and t- to that point, you find out that that's really just part of it, right? That's not the whole thing. Uh, because what do you do outside of church? Because otherwise it's like, I can live however I want to outside of church. When I come to church, it has to be a certain way. No, he's like, no, the kingdom is much more than just what you do in the church confines. It's more than that. It's more than you being involved even in outreach efforts, though it is that. But it's more than that. Seeking the kingdom of God is deeper than that. And in this section of scripture, you saw and you heard that Jesus brings up some of the most essential and necessary things of life. Like he brought up food. He brought up raiment. He brought up your own life. And he says, what do you think about those things? What are you, what are you seeking for? And you saw that he made some very strong statements about those things. And it's really important that you also know that at this time in history, that when Jesus was speaking to this audience, that many of them at that time lived off of literally what they are bringing in on a day-to-day basis. That's how we're living. Like it, we, this was a pre-industrialized society. It wasn't like I could go stockpile at Walmart for a month or I could buy food storage. This was, what am I going to have today? If they wanted food, they had to raise the food. They had to cultivate the food. They had to go and find the water. They, they had to do all that. And if they were in desperation, they would even find themselves fishing all night. Because we need food for the family. We need to pay the bills. We, we had to do that. And, and many people would get paid, uh, not just in monetary value, but some people would get paid by food. Like that was your payment for the day. And you even hear Jesus kind of express this uh, in the Lord's Prayer. He says, give us as they are daily bread. He didn't say weekly bread, monthly bread. Why was it daily? Because that's how they were living. It was many times on a day-to-day basis. But as you looked at the passage and listened to it with me as I was standing there as well, Christ is telling these very people not to seek those things. In fact, he goes even farther than that. And he tells them that if they do seek those things, then they would be identifying with a Gentile. Now, that may not mean a lot uh, to you particularly, but if you understand how the Jew and Gentile dynamic was, that would be shocking. It'd be an utter shock for you to be sitting there, having raised a good Jew all of your life, and have tried to adhere to the law as best as you could, and then to be called a Gentile. To be called a person who was living no better than someone who would offer sacrifices to Baal and some Molech or serve a Roman Empire, that you'd be you'd be no better than a lost person, basically. That's what Jesus was saying. I mean, you remember what what Jesus the with, with the Grecian woman who came to Jesus, what she said to him? She was asking for him to do a request, and here's what he said: it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it unto the dogs. It's a pretty strong statement, right? To make to a non-Jew. But that's what he said. And she said, well, yeah, she said, but the dogs under the table, you know, they eat of the children's crumb. And so that, 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 the, 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 in other words, what I'm trying to make sure you understand is how offensive it would be to be labeled a Gentile. And, and, and what were the grounds? Well, the grounds of being identified as one is if they were seeking those things. But what's the irony of that? Well, how, how could they not? Like, that's what they were doing every day. And so, so what's going on here? Well, what Jesus is doing in this section of verses 25 to 34 is he is bringing us right back to an idea that he has just given us in verses 19 to 24. And you were listening to it with me where Jesus is talking about, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but, but rather in heaven. Well, what's the, what's the point of it? Well, because you can't serve two masters. You're not going to be able to do both of those things. You have to choose one of them. And so that was the principle. He was talking about the the focus of our life. What is our life made up on? What is our life driving towards? And after having given that teaching, then in verses 25 to 34, he then explains to us what that looks like practically. So I can tell you don't serve two masters, but you may sit there and say, what does it look like? Well, it looks like verse 25 to 34. What Jesus is doing is he is showing us practically he describes what it looks like to not serve two masters in a day-to-day context in other words if you were going to live what he's saying in verse 19 to 24 then what that would look like is i don't want you to take thought for food and i don't want you to take thought for clothing 
and your stature and all those things. Don't take thought for that. And you're thinking, wow, that, that, that's just crazy. I mean, he mentions this take no thought three times in these verses. Now, just before we go any farther for your for your mental sake here, Christ is not saying don't plan out your week. He's not saying, why would you guys go over Tuesday? You don't know what's going to happen, right? And you kind of go crazy like in James, like, you know, you don't don't boast of tomorrow. We're not boasting trying to plan out our day. We're just trying to try, try to use our time wisely and be stewards of it. But Jesus was the one who said, well, what man's going to go out and build a, a tower and doesn't first sit down and consider the cost and consider if he has sufficient to build. So, so Jesus is not against Jesus is not against a thought out life. Not at all. Jesus is against a wrongly focused life. And what a wrongly focused life not only leads you to, but keeps you from. And if you consider the whole book of Matthew and the 28 chapters that he wrote, there are only seven times where he brings up and addresses the idea of worry. In all 28 chapters, only seven instances and I want you to know that six of them are just in this little section here of nine verses. Six times he addresses that issue in nine verses out of 28 chapters. So you think he's trying to get a, an idea across. He is. And Jesus makes this entire argument based around three examples. And you saw them with me. And we'll look at the first one in verse 26. It's about the birds. He says, behold, the fowls of the air. For they sow not, and neither do the reap, nor gather into barns. Now, I think this is amazing because when you go through the scripture, you would probably, especially if you have kids and you live, we live in Proverbs land a lot. Um, when you go through the scripture, you find that there are certain creatures or certain uh, parts of creation that God kind of elevates and uses as teaching points. Like if you're lazy, then you go to the ant. You, if you're a sluggard, look at that. Look what the ant does. The guy, look at that thing. He's preparing all the time because he, did, he has to get his meat in the, in the summer for the heart. He's getting ready for what's coming. And you have the locusts who, they don't have any leader. They don't have any type of walkie-talkies to communicate. But those guys travel around and accomplish things because they, they don't need a leader. This is how they function. God made them that way. God gave them these crowning characteristics. These, God gave them these, these ethics and this ability to do things. And God admonishes us that if we are struggling with a, a character trait or a flaw in our life, that we can go and we can see, look, look what they're doing. But when you go through the scripture, you don't really see a lot about birds in this respect because birds really don't plan for the future, right? You, you don't see them doing that. They don't make provision for the future. But what does Jesus say about them? Yet your heavenly father fee feedeth them. Well, that's amazing that birds don't do any planning and yet they eat. That, that, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? There, there's no worry in the lives of birds. There's no anxiety. Birds just exist. They do what God programmed them to do. Now, now he's not advocating laziness. I understand the birds, though fed by God, they are active. They will go and they will find the worm and they will build the nest and they will take care of their young. And they, they do that and they, and they migrate to where food is. But the reality of the bird is they're not focused on that. Their life isn't consumed with that thought. You don't see birds flying around with little briefcases full of extra food just in case they hit a tough spot. They're not prepping, right? They're not doing that kind of stuff. And the point he's making is very simple that if the birds who can't plan ahead and don't plan ahead, if they have no reason to worry, then certainly you, who I've created, um, and dude with reason, so you can plan, you have no reason to worry. And he says, well, well look, what, what's the answer? What, are, are you not much better than they? Is your God, view of God really that small that you would think he would treat a bird better than his own creation, like his own, in his, made, in his own image? That's what Jesus is arguing right there. And it's, it's not a, a deep argument, but it is a very simple and profound argument. And that's the first one he makes. He compares it to that realm. And then he goes on to, a second issue, which you see in verse 27, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature. Now, for the longest time, I would read this up until really, actually this year, I would read that and I would just kind of lazily think, oh, you know, the cubit stature, you know, I, I, I always thought he was talking about height, you know, which of you can add to your height. Now, now, whether or not it would mean that um, really doesn't change the principle. And so, but, but you think about this, the context, I want to tell you what I, th I think it's referring to. But if you think about this, the word that he uses, look at, look at it again, 
uh, thought can, which of you been thinking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? The word for stature biblically can also mean an age. It can mean a span of t- a span. And then you have, of course, the other word. He's talking about a cubit. We know that's a defined measurement. So it's almost like this. What Jesus, I believe, is saying based on the context is which of you by by taking thought can add on to his span? Which of you by taking thought can really enhance your life? I mean, how many of you would want to be this much taller, right? This is a cubit. That may be, some of you might be like, yeah, it'd be great. Like my kids are like, yeah, of course, I don't want to be your size. But some of us, that'd be kind of like you definitely should not be that tall, right? That'd be really bad in the back. And so, so Jesus saying is, are you really going to make your life extend your life just by worry? I mean, don't you and I know that worry actually decreases our life? Haven't we seen enough studies and have, have enough examples? Maybe even you've lived there yourself where you've been got ulcers that, and you've gotten so much into worry that it causes you to have physiological problems. And that you don't think that God could have made it so that when we engage in worry that it, it could actually make our lives better. The God who made the human body. But, but isn't it ironic that God made it so that when we engage in worry, we actually decrease our lifespan? We actually take away from the span of our life. We shorten our stature. And that's what Jesus is saying is like, you're not going to make your life longer by worrying. Matter of fact, you're going to make it worse. (laughs) It's our lifespan, no less than our food and clothing, they're gifts from God. This is God has given them to us. And worrying about it isn't going to change that for you. And then he goes to his last example in verse 28. And he says, and why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Now that's even more amazing. And if you've noticed what Jesus is doing here is he is, he is taking his basic premise, his argument, and he is just tightening it down. He is making a stronger case each time. This is the strongest one he's made here. You say, well, how is it stronger? Well, this is what's amazing. Birds are at least active. But what do flowers do? They don't do anything. I mean, they're just there. Like if you have a, a group of toddlers running towards a bird, they're, it's going to move. It's pretty smart too. Uh, but what are flowers going to do? They're going to get trampled and die. They, they, they don't move and say, oh, it's little kids coming. They, 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 they sit there. And, and, and what's amazing is what catches our attention about flowers, not only are there billions and billions, I don't even know how many there are on earth, but it's, it's not only is there quantity, but it's the magnificence of the flower. What do you mean by the magnificence of the flower? The flower is beyond what the best of any human art can achieve. If you, if, you, if you don't believe me, just go and look at the next batch of plastic flowers. You could spot them from a distance. Like, those aren't real. I know. And, and, and if you're like, okay, well, then I'll up, I up the game. I'll get a silk flower. So not the same thing. And here's the thing. Man can print a gun in a 3D printer. We can do all kinds of crazy stuff, but we can't make a flower look real. It's like, what is going on? Man, with all of his creativity and all his ingenuity and all his money, cannot imitate one of the simplest parts of creation. He can't do that. It's a nice effort, but the fake things don't have the, the grace and the beauty and, and there's a, because there's a quality and there's a substance about a, the real thing that is unmatchable. And here's the reality that God creates billions upon billions of them in all of the variety. And here's the thing. They're fragile. They're here today and gone tomorrow. They're cast in the oven. They're not very uh, amazing, but God still spent the time and the thought and the loving care to, to make something like that. He spends all that time to make it that ornate and to make it that colorful and to have that, that fragrance and it's here and gone. And Jesus saying is, if God creates with such care things that are so fragile and so gone, then don't you think that his care and his love for his higher creation is going to be greater than that? You don't think it's going to be? And if you don't think that, then what does that say what you think about God? That's what he's arguing here. Now, now some people may argue, I wouldn't say a Christian would argue this, but maybe an atheist or someone who would be anti-scripture would say, well, does God really provide so bountifully for the birds and for humanity? 
Have you seen all of the calamities? Have you seen the famines? Have you seen the pestilences? Have you seen that there are huge numbers of birds every year that die? And they die sometimes from lack of finding suitable food or the right food or they get poisonous food. And, and what about the experience of, of many Christians throughout time who have suffered through uh, in history, who, who suffered persecution and in that persecution experienced starvation and malnourishment and ultimately death? And what about the fact that right now they say over 50 percent of all believers, they live in that two thirds part of the world where they're below poverty line? Are, are you, do you not know that? Do you not know that there are so many of the Christians that, that you are talking about, that God cares about, they would say, quote unquote, that a large number of them right now are living below poverty and they can't obtain enough food and, and some of them do die through famine? And you're going to sit up here and say that God provides so well for his people? It doesn't seem like much of a promise, does it? That's what they would say. And my answer to that would be, you've, you've misunderstood the passage. And I think that the average church member has misunderstood the passage. Because when you look back at, at what he is saying here, he says he's going to provide all these things. Well, what does he mean by all these things? Well, he's not saying you'll get Netflix. He's not saying you're going to have a new car. He's not saying you'll even have a house. What does he mean by all these things? Well, well, as I study this out, the only thing you can come down to is the, the greater context of the Sermon on the Mount. What is the whole thing about? Glorifying God. It's about getting God the glory that he's due, being like your father in heaven and glorifying God. And so then as I look at all these things, the greater context would say this, that it's kind of like Philippians 4, where, where Paul is saying that my God shall supply all your needs according to riches and glory. What do you mean by all your needs? That would be everything that you need, not as in need itself, but everything that you need in order to glorify God. You'll have that whatever you need to glorify God. And this is the truth that we have to understand, that God calls on some people to glorify him by dying. I mean, that's what our Savior did. I mean, he glorified God through death, and he made the way for us. And so this is what he's getting at, uh, here to us. You know, and this is the truth that I, I don't want to live any less than God wants me to live. And I don't want to live any longer than he wants me to live. Because I think as a Christian, our mindset should be this. We should want to live exactly as long as he wants us to live. And here's the reality. Um, I can shorten that process, like through worry. I can mess that up by engaging in sin. I, I can disobey God like the Corinthians did and some of them slept. I, I can shorten that process. But how long does God want me to live? Well, as long as he wants. I mean, yeah, it's circular. That's fine. It's God. He made it. Okay, here's how long I'll be on earth, as long as his plan is for me to be here. That's how long I'll be here. And if you can have that mindset, if you can have that understanding, then what could you possibly worry about? Now think about that. If you believe that God has given you the gift of life and has called you to serve him in this world, then you would believe then that he will give you and has given you all the things that are necessary in order to fulfill that plan. And if there's something that you don't have, it's because you don't need that. And if you needed it, then you'll have it. Now I understand that that's not really a natural way of thinking, is it? No, it's not a natural way of thinking. And that's why he brings up the issue of faith then in verse 30. Look what he says at the end of verse 30. He says, O oh, ye of little faith. And that's, that's, that's what, what he's getting at. Because those without Christ, well, they're entirely consumed by all these things. They have one life. And it's, as, it's completely up to them. And it's only going to be as good as they make it. But those of us who have faith in a God that made us and loves us, we understand we are to be characterized by that faith. And that faith should look like something in our life. And it would look like this. We don't have to worry about things. And to me, this is what makes worry such a big deal because worry strikes at the character and nature of God. I mean, it's the exact opposite of trust. And that's why Jesus identifies it as he does in this verse here. He says, you know what? If you're going to worry, then you are living just like a Gentile. You're living just like somebody who doesn't have a father, who doesn't have a God that they would claim. You're living just like that. 
Because when you are living in worry, you are living as if there isn't a God who's made you. And the only antidote to that is in verse 33. That's, I think it's why he says it. Right after he says that, then he goes on to verse 32. He says, but here's what I want you to do then. I want you to seek first the kingdom of God. That, 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 that's the solution for you. Seek the kingdom of God. Because, and, and this is a reality. I want you to understand this. In our Western society, because we have less worry and fear of securing our daily needs and our daily bread, you know what? We should be even more liberated to, search, to seek the kingdom, shouldn't we? Now, I want you to think about that. Because while in their day, their concern was whether they would have dinner that night. Really? Yeah, why were they out fishing all night then? They, they needed food and they needed money. That was their concern. Uh, they need to take care of them. And so while their daily concerns were whether they would have dinner that night, ours are more like this. What are we going to watch tonight? And what day is that on? And how about Saturday? Are we going to you know, watch a couple of series of that? Or what are we going to do? Or what hobby do I want to pursue today or this week? That's kind of what our concerns are. And the sad reality is, is really this, that instead of using our liberation the mental energy that it takes to think about what am I going to eat tonight, instead of using our liberation from those daily concerns and those daily issues of seeking those necessary things, what we do is we often use that liberation to pursue our own things and not the kingdom of God and to pursue lesser things. But isn't our life more than a hobby? And isn't our life more than a title at work? And isn't our life more than stats on a sports team? And isn't our life more than binge watching a series? And isn't our life more than a high score in a video game? Amen. Isn't our life more than that? Of course our life's more than that. Be our life is more than just getting up and going to work and coming home and going to bed and doing that day and day and day and day. Our life is more than that. Our, because our life is more than all these things. That's Amen. what he's arguing here. That's how the lower creation live. They live in the mundane cycle. That's how they live. But God made us in his image. And God made us for a purpose. And what is that purpose? Well, he tells us it's to seek the kingdom of God. But not just seek it once you get out of high school or seek it when you get, when you get your job landed. He said seek it first. Amen. He's put in a priority to it. Seek it first. And this isn't about you getting more involved in church, though that is an application. Meaning this, it doesn't end there. That, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what Jesus is trying to at here. This isn't God will make your finances better if you give. No, no, no. Let me, let me tell you this. It's actually better than that. Well, how is it better than that? Here's what God's saying. You can seek the kingdom of God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and not have to worry about these things. And it's because you don't have to worry about these things that you can seek it with all your undivided attention. You work, but as you work as a Christian, what do we, who do we work for? Well, under the Lord. We work for him. Even though we're worth another earthly representative, we're representing Christ when we work. And so therefore, if we lose our job because we don't lie for our boss to cover him, or because we don't fudge numbers to make something look better, or because we don't engage in unethical and ungodly practices, we may have that fear of losing our job, but because we have a father, we can be honest and be like God in that workplace. And though we may lose our job, we don't have to worry because we have a father. We have a father who will take care of what we have. And I, I'm not speaking about this like I, I haven't experienced this, by the way. I've went through this my own, in my own life. And I, when, I, when I lost my job working at a bank and I was going through Bible college and I was trying to finish up and we had just got married and our, our first son was like nine months old or somewhere in there and she was staying at home. And so I was the only one bringing an income and uh, I was working at a bank and I was still paying off my, my grad school degree and paying for all that. And we were living in a, 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 10 minutes up the road from the school and I was working at the bank, had been there for a year and I was kind of, you know, I think most Christians, if they're actually being Christian in their work, they're going to move up naturally in a job because you're honest, dependable reliable. And so as I was just working, I was kind of moving up and I was being trained and cross trained to get into personal loans and financial things and mortgages. And so I went from being a teller up to a, a, a personal banker and I was kind of moving my way up there. And so in, in that process, you begin to develop clientele and people you develop relationships with. 
And I was one of the top tellers that they had. And they all knew that eventually I was going to be leaving the bank to go into ministry. Like, it wasn't like I hid that. I went to Bible college, right? I mean, it wasn't like you're hiding that at all. And I would ask off for Bible college functions. I would ask off for things. And so I would was doing all that. And the, the problem was, is that um, sometimes in the break rooms, we there would be some stuff going on in there. Topics talked about uh, pressures to engage in things or come out to parties and doing things. And I wouldn't have anything to do with it. And I wasn't mean about it. I just would never engage in those things, of course. And that kind of got me a reputation for a while. Well, then what really was starting to be the rub was there were some different um, uh, events or, or promotional things that, that the branch, the area was manager was running. And if everybody participated in the branch, then it would mean a pizza party or it would mean like a bonus. And one of them was so simple. It was, we want you to all give money towards like the United Way or some type of organization. And I didn't want to do that. And I remember being in the break room and being confronted on different occasions because I didn't want to give to an ungodly organization and support that. And the accusation was, well, you're not very loving as a Christian. You don't even want to give to anything. I was like, I already give to my church. I give to missions. I give to this. I give to that. I'm, I'm giving my life to go give to other people. I mean, like my whole life is about other people. So like you can't really say that I'm unloving for doing that. And so anyways, that was that. And, and so I lost the ability for the branch to have a couple of these bonuses. Well, that just made people mad. And so what happened was it was a ticking time bomb. And so one day I went into work and I, after having come down, I went to Topeka and, and, and kind of candidated, if you will. I went back over the weekend and it's Monday, Tuesday or Monday and I'm at the branch and talking to clients and you talk about the weekend on Monday or Tuesday. And I just brought up, yeah, I was out uh, looking at a church, you know, oh, I'm looking at a church, oh, I'm gonna go into ministry and I'm just, you know, figuring that out. And my, my manager overheard that. And, uh, and then I go in the next day and, and then I got fired. And the, the, the grounds of accusation was I was conflict of interest. That I was in a job, but I was engaging in the hunting of another job. And you really can't do that. It's not really ethical, right? I mean, technically in, in the business world, like if you're in a job and you're looking at another one, like that's, that's no good. And so that, that's what happened. And I, I, I kind of argued, well, that really is crazy because you guys know in two months I'm graduating. Like, you couldn't let me go for two months. I'm your top teller. Why would you, you know, do that? And so I lost my job. And as I went around looking for other jobs, you know, naturally a, a good segue from that is insurance because you're already kind of in some of that understanding. And so I went to some things and I would turn my resume in like, oh, this is great. Yeah, man, uh, come in for an interview. I'd go in there and they'd ask me, well, what are your dreams? What do you hope to do? And in the role, they're looking, make millions of dollars, get rich, you know, help, help us get rich. And I'm like, I honestly, I got two months and I'm leaving. Yeah, good luck getting a job, right? And they'd say that. But what was my option? Well, I could have lied. I could have just taken advantage and said, well, I'm not going to be in this state anyways. I'm moving to Kansas, so who cares? But I didn't feel like it was ethical. So what happened was I never got a job. So for three months, we pretty much burned through everything we had saved, whatever that, I can't remember what it was, but it wasn't, it wasn't very much. We burned through all of that as I was still paying bills. And you say, well, what happened? Well, two and a half months or so into that, three months into that, uh, my church found out and, and, and called and said, hey, we found out what happened. And so we, we voted unanimously to back pay you from the day you visited all the way up. We're going to send you one lump sum of salary for every week. And then we're going to pay you every week until you get here, whether that's July or August. And that was amazing. That was amazing. Well, what was it? Well, it was, I mean, God cares for you. Right, God takes care of you. Now, I could have engaged. I could have went and got out. All kinds of crazy things. I could have lied about things. I could have got into programs and seedy things just to try to make the money. But at the end of the day, my, I had a father who cared about me. And he took care of me. It's the thing. Seeking the kingdom of God, is, 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 it's a mindset, really. It's not just, Lord, here's this and here's this talent. It, it's, it's, no, seeking the kingdom of God first is, Lord, here's my life. What do you want to do with it? Here's my life. And never in my life have I, have I found this to be more true than right now. I mean, we don't have a house. We sold that. Uh, we don't have really fixed income. We don't have a place to lay our heads or food to eat unless God has provided it. And you know what? He has every day. Every day. You know, I think sometimes as Christians, we have this incredibly high bar before we get involved in serving God. We can say, well, I just need God to do this or do this. And I'm not talking about even becoming, getting into full-time ministry per se, like in that context. I'm just saying this. We can approach it 
God and say, well, I'm not going to get involved in outreach or get involved in this area or teaching a class or, or, or cleaning the building unless, unless, man, like I need to just know. And it's like, it's like this. Okay, I understand that sentiment. So I don't know anybody who, who, who prays before they binge watch Netflix. Like, no one's in there like, okay, um, hold on, babe, let's pray before we spend f- five hours tonight watching that. No, no one's doing that. Like, like I, 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 don't, I don't think that we're consistent with how we apply that principle. I, I don't think we put a second thought to spending 10 hours in a week on a hobby or interest of ours. But if it came to a 10-hour time commitment, even less than that, typically in a church setting in a week, we're like, no, nah, I'm out. Well, look, look I, I understand that, that many of you probably work at least 40 hours or 50 hours or 60 hours of work a week. I, I get that. But the question would be, when you get off work, what do you think about? You know, what, what, is, what is your mindset? What, what do you focus on? Do you think about the lost? Do you think about the church? Do you think about the kingdom of God, basically? Here's, the, here's what Jesus wants you to know. Instead of using your liberation, which we definitely have, from the confines and the daily mental and drains of these things, instead of using that liberation to pursue our own interests, let's use it to seek the kingdom of God more. Let's throw that into that. And when it comes to the church, if there's a need for serving, instead of dragging your feet about it, get involved. Because honestly, in, until your plate is full of seeking the kingdom of God, can you really get involved in the wrong area? I mean, our life is supposed to be about the kingdom of God. It's supposed to be about those things. And when you find yourself beginning to worry, what should you do? Well, you, go back to your father and recognize him for who he is, your father, and that he'll take care of you and that you should not just share your burdens, but give your burdens to him. Now, look at verse 34 as we we end. I think this is really good that he would say this. He again again says, take therefore, a third time, no thought for the morrow. You know, they say that there's there's two days that God won't help you with. I've I've read this somewhere. I thought it was pretty pretty novel. Yesterday and tomorrow, because they don't exist. What, what's, what, what's our focus? It's today. He says, you know, don't, don't worry about don't, don't, don't worry about tomorrow, okay? Your father knows what you need. And though, and though although God's provision is sure, we know that God's going to take care of us. He, he does, right? That does not exempt us from problems. And that's what he says. He says, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Now look, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. God's not saying it's going to be a bed of roses. He's not saying it's going to be amazing. What he's saying is this, that when you do come against difficulty and conflict, you don't have to engage in the worry of a Gentile because you have a father who already knows what you need and he'll take care of you. And if he does not take care of you with what you think you need, it's because you don't need it. And sometimes God will withhold things from us that maybe we would think we would need objectively, but because he wants to take us deeper with him. He may withhold from us friendships. He may withhold from us money. He may withhold from us things that only because it would drive us to know him more through suffering. And God does that kind of stuff. But the truth is this. Listen, if you put the proper amount of attention on the kingdom of God, then God is going to put the proper amount of attention on that you need. He's going to take care of you. And that's a fact. But I want you to understand that that is a fact that is lived by faith. It's an issue of faith. And so my question would be, well, what is your commitment level to the kingdom of God? Just think about that. What is your commitment level to the kingdom of God? Because I believe that this is one of those areas that if you don't understand this or get this right, it, it will permanently alter the quality of on the direction, not just of your life here, but eternity. Because we're not just living for this age. There's another one coming. I'm not talking about losing salvation. I'm talking about this, that we want to cast the crowns at his feet, that we want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. We want to be that to him. And so what, how are we going to find it out? Well, um, seek him first then, and you'll find that. Would you stand with me this afternoon? I'm not sure.